from cars with a license to kill, to V12s that scream from the heavens. And maybe the coolest business up front party in the backmobile you've ever seen. Many of these cars were killed off before their time, and a few of these should never have been built in the first place. Today, we've got 32 killed off cars, and we're ranking them from worst to best. Let's get into it. To start, this might be the worst car they ever killed off, and we can't thank them enough for it. Are we calling the Aztec the worst car ever made just because it's ugly? Honestly, yes. There's also the fact that it might be cursed? The first ever season of Survivor included a Pontiac Aztec as a prize in addition to the million dollars. The first ever winner, Richard Hatch, ended up in prison for tax evasion after he decided not to pay taxes on his winnings, which included the Aztec. That's right. This car indirectly sent a man to prison. Maybe it's just the fact that he didn't pay his taxes, but still, we blame the Aztec. The Aztec's dorky demeanor was further solidified when it was cast as Walter White's daily driver in Breaking Bad. This is, of course, before his transformation to Heisenberg. They couldn't have picked a better car to show his humble and humiliated status before transforming into the one who knocks. I am the one who knocks. The Chevette probably is the worst car ever made. But you understand why we had to rank the Aztec below it, right? Designed and introduced in response to the 1973 oil crisis, the Chevette rolled off the assembly line in 1976. It was poorly made, unreliable, and slow. It had a whopping 19.6 second trip from 0 to 60, thanks to its whopping real-world horsepower rating of... 23. 23 horsepower. The sacrifice in power was supposed to be made up in fuel efficiency, and at the time, it was claimed as getting 28 miles per gallon city, 40 miles per gallon highway. But based on modern, more accurate estimations, it's probably more like 24 to 27 miles per gallon. The Chevette wasn't worth the metal and rubber it's made out of, and to top it all off, it came from a manufacturer that should have known better. Speaking of problems at GM, the Aztec is ugly, Chevette is just plain awful, but this next pick has the worst reputation of any car in American history. The unsafe at any speed, Chevy Corvair. This rear engine compact was built to compete with European imports like the Beetle, but its rear engine mounting and swing axle suspension made for poor handling even at the best of times. After several high profile auto accidents and deaths, lawsuits were brought up against GM regarding the Corvair's handling. Consumer rights activist Ralph Nader took notice and wrote Unsafe at Any Speed, which exposed the fact that GM had willfully ignored its own engineers when they pointed out the safety hazards posed by the Corvair. Although there are some mixed opinions on Nader and a potential conspiracy theory. GM had a fiasco on their hands. In response, the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act was passed, which allowed the federal government to set and require safety standards on automakers. They were cool cars though. The trouble doesn't stop for GM there because the next on this list is the Pontiac Fiero. And if you know anything about the Fiero, it's that it liked to catch in fuego. By 1987, it was apparent that roughly 20% of 84 model year Fieros suffered an engine fire. It's a shame because the Fiero was innovative in many ways. It was the first mass produced American mid-engine sports car. It was cost effective to build because engineers figured out how to build it using shared parts from other GM vehicles. And it really did get 50 miles to the gallon. But none of that matters if your car is literally on fire. GM pulled the plug on the Fiero in 1988. Like the Aztec, the PT Cruiser had divisive looks. The throwback 1930s styling wasn't for everybody, and the styling constricted access to the engine bay, which is a shame because PT Cruisers frequently needed work, from wiring harnesses to steering fluid leaks. The NHTSA had to put out several recalls on the PT over its checkered run. Chrysler had a lot of hopes riding on the PT Cruiser, but it was ultimately a letdown. The Cruiser enjoys a cult following among the New Balance wearing dads, but it still ranks towards the back of this list. Speaking of dad cars, 
The Scion XB wasn't exactly a sales disaster. It just caught on with the wrong crowd. It was supposed to grab young people's attention with its unusual looks and modest MSRP. When it launched under Toyota's hip, young person focused Scion brand in 2003. The car resonated with consumers for its practicality, but not the consumers Toyota was targeting. It turns out the average age of an XB buyer was 46. Uh, that's about twice the age Scion was meant for. So, while the XB sold well relative to other Scion offerings, Toyota decided to close up shop on the entire Scion brand in 2016. Now, you've got to give it to Plymouth. They really swung for the fences with their 90s hot rod, the Prowler. But instead of a home run, they hit a foul. The problem started right from the concept. A modern hot rod right from the factory. But ask any 1950s grease monkey and they'll tell you, a hot rod is built not bought. A car that looks like this might work as a kit car, but when it showed up in showrooms, it got looks for the wrong reasons. It was powered by an uninspiring V6 that only put out 217 brake horsepower. Couple that with the fact that it was only available with a 4-speed automatic, that snuffed out what little interest there was. By 1999, they upgraded the engine to put out 253 horsepower, but it was too little, too late. And the Prowler's fate was sealed when it went out of production in 2002. I still actually like the Prowler though. At least it's interesting. Whew! Okay, I think that's it for the cars that probably would have been better off never leaving the design studio. But let's get into the ones that genuinely deserve to live! From 1979 to 2001, the Honda Prelude was one of the most impressive front-wheel drive offerings from Honda. It introduced the first mass-produced four-wheel steering system, which made it handle like a dream. Road and Track tested it in a slalom course against a Corvette, a couple Porsches and Ferraris, and the Prelude bested them all. It was even used as a safety car at the 1994 Suzuka Grand Prix. So why did Honda kill the Prelude in 2001? Well, anyone who wanted a roomier sedan got an Accord. If you wanted something sporty, you could get a Civic Si or Integra for less money. There just wasn't room in the lineup to keep the Prelude around, which is a shame. The Sky was the swan song of the Saturn brand. It's a sweet little front-engine rear-drive roadster. The Redline Edition was the version to get. It put down 260 horsepower from the turbocharged inline-four Ecotech engine. Too bad it only ran from 2007 to 2010, when GM shut the doors on Saturn entirely. <sighs> they really were cool little cars, and honestly, solid alternatives to the Mazda Miata. Oh well. It's always sad to see an enthusiast car get cancelled. The Veloster, specifically the N-Badged performance version, was clearly designed with enthusiasts in mind. It puts up a respectable 275 horsepower and can do 0 to 60 in 5 seconds flat. But the three door design just didn't land with consumers. It's either one door too many or one door too few, depending on who you ask. 2002 will be the Veloster N's final year, but we think this funky little hatch deserves more. Toyota took cues from mid engine rear wheel drive legends to make the affordable daily drivable sports car the MR2. In fact, the second gen SW20 took its styling cues from the Ferrari 308 and 340, so much so that it was dubbed the poor man's Ferrari. I mean, if you're gonna steal, steal from the best, right? I wish Toyota still made a car that looked this damn good. Our next pick is also a bit of a Ferrari lookalike. In the heyday of the Roadster, if you wanted a styling ride, you didn't drive a Triumph. You didn't want an MGB, you wanted an Alfa Romeo Spider. This gorgeous little roadster was the perfect pick for ripping up the twisties from 1966 all the way to 1994. The DNA of the car was developed by legendary Italian design firm Pininfarina, the same firm that's responsible for Ferrari classics like the Testarossa, the Daytona, and the 308. The Alfa Romeo Spider doesn't go as fast as a Ferrari, but you could definitely expect it to turn the heads. And while the more contemporary Alfa Romeo 4C eventually released a Spider variant, we miss the original. You know it, you love it. This bad boy handles business in the front and parties in the back. The El Camino is an American classic. The 1970 Super Sport Edition might just be the most unashamedly American vehicle ever made. 
The SS version came with the Chevy 454 V8 big block under the hood, packing a reported 450 horsepower. It had power, utility, and a luxurious and refined interior, S sort of. Driving a Camino Supersport is like wearing a tuxedo with brass knuckles. It's rough and tumble and elegant at the same time. It's literally a muscle car you could tow your fishing boat with. It's too bad Toyota stopped offering the FJ Cruiser in 2014, because the desire for adventure-ready vehicles has completely exploded since. The demand for FJ Cruisers is bigger than ever. It's not crazy to see them going for forty dollars to $50,000 used. In December 2021, a 2014 FJ Cruiser with just 63 miles sold for 81 grand on Bring a Trailer. You could buy a brand new 4Runner and have it fully kitted for overlanding, for less. But the 4Runner doesn't have that old school off-road charm of the FJ Cruiser. The FJ has continued to be produced and sold in foreign markets after 2014, but this year, 2022, will be the final edition of the FJ Cruiser anywhere. Come on, Toyota! Don't let the Bronco and Wrangler have all the fun! Like the XB we already mentioned, the Honda Element is a bit of a toaster on wheels. But even if it didn't kill it in the looks department, it was an ultra-practical SUV thing with a go-anywhere attitude. It even had plastic flooring and stain-resistant seats, so after you were done adventuring, you could just hose down the interior to clean it up. There was even a dog-friendly edition that was complete with spill-proof water bowls and a ramp to help Fido get in and out. Brad used to own one, but the success of the Element sibling, the CRV, spelled its downfall. Honda CRV dominated the crossover market, which made the Element redundant. But unlike the Element, you can't just hose down the interior of a CRV. Trust me, you don't want to try. The Ford Focus RS got everything right. Ford nailed the all wheel drive system, complete with torque vectoring, which could launch you perfectly out of every apex or slay the tires in drift mode. The 2.3 liter turbocharged four banger could get you from zero to 60 in four and a half seconds. And it was only available in a manual transmission. From 2016 to 2018, the Focus RS was the king of hot hatches, which is why we're still big sad Ford chose to discontinue the Focus RS. Want a comfortable passenger car that has the utility of a pickup truck? Today, our options are the Ford Maverick and Hyundai Santa Cruz. 20 years ago, your only option was the Subaru Baja. It's basically an old Outback with a truck bed. And the Baja Turbo introduced in 2004 were quick-ish, doing 0-60 to 60 in 7 seconds, which at the time was pretty good compared to other station wagons and pickups, and certainly better than any other station wagons with a truck bed on the market. Oh, there, there, there weren't any other? Yeah, that makes sense. Ultimately, the Baja was just too far ahead of its time, which is a shame because this formula is working today. If only Subaru had been bold enough to keep the Baja around. Does anyone else think it looks like it belongs in Crazy Taxi? <laughs> Let me know down in the comments. In 1998, the Germans perfected the British Roadster. How'd they do that? First, they took the BMW Motorsport S62 V8 engine, the same one found in the E39 M5, which was good for 400 horsepower. Then, they dropped it into a lightweight, all-aluminum chassis and body just behind the front axle for a perfect 50-50 weight distribution. Then they had Henrik Fisker, the designer of the Aston Martin Vantage and DB9 and current chairman of Fisker Automotive, design the body and the interior. The result was the BMW Z8, and it was an instant classic. So classy, in fact, that James Bond took one for a ride in 1999's The World Is Not Enough. But it was like the lamest Bond car scene ever. The fact that the average price of a used Z8 today is around $200,000 should be proof enough that if BMW had just kept them in production, they would have found a market. Speaking of German automakers, what do you get when you combine the philosophy of Detroit muscle with German precision engineering? get a Porsche with a 5-liter V8 sitting in front and raw ripping power to the rear wheels. In short, you get the Porsche 928. From 1977 to 1995, the 928 was Germany's muscle car. 
By the end of its run, it was packing around 350 ponies with its 5.4 liter V8 in the GTS model. We would have loved to see Porsche continue to develop the concept, but instead they decided to go all in on mid and rear engine cars. And based on how that's gone for the company, I guess we can't really blame them. Cars produced on the Nissan S platform have gone by many names across several different markets, the best known stateside being the 240SX. The 240SX and other cars released under this platform are among the best drifting cars ever made. Nissan decided North America didn't need the SX platform anymore after 1998, but continued offering new models around the world until 2002. Just as Nissan have refreshed the Z to compete with Toyota's revised Supra, we wish they'd bring back the 240SX to compete with the GR86, maybe one day. Despite nefarious beginnings, the Volkswagen Beetle has gone on to be one of the most iconic cars of all time. The silhouette is instantly recognizable, and its cult status has been earned by its clever design, and even cleverer marketing. You can't help but smile when you see one. It's basically the cutest car ever made. Volkswagen let go of the bug in 2019, but don't be surprised to see an EV return in the near future. The 900 was one of Saab's longest running and most versatile models. During its 20 year life, it was offered as a two door and a four door sedan, two door and three door hatchback, and as a convertible. The 900 Turbo is especially sought after to this day. They were quirky and weird and bought strictly by college professors, but the world was a better place with those still kicking around. The XJ was designed to be the definition of luxury. When it was introduced in 1968, it was the last Jaguar developed to have direct design input from the company's founder, Sir William Lyons. It's one of the finest pieces of British engineering, and it's the car of choice for prime ministers. Richard Hammond just bought his XJR back because how badly he missed it and the late Queen Elizabeth II had a bespoke XJ hearse built at her request so that her final ride could be an ultimate luxury. We're paying our respects to her and the car she loved by putting the XJ in our top 10 discontinued cars. This Pontiac Pony car needs no introduction. The Trans Am was a silver screen star. The car was made famous in movies like MCQ, Cannonball, and Smokey and the Bandit. Now we could have put the G8 or the GTO here, but I think the Trans Am best captures the beauty and performance of Pontiac's glory days. It was a sad day in 2002 when Pontiac discontinued one of their best known cars, and sadder still when GM eventually closed the doors on Pontiac entirely. Next time you see one, make sure you salute that LS legend. The Dodge Magnum, aka the Charger Wagon, was introduced in 2005. But it was the 2006 SRT8 Magnum that we really care about. It packed the heat with the 6.1 liter Hemi V8 and 425 sweet horses to terrorize the streets with. Sure, it's not beating the RS6, E63 AMG, or M5 in the performance wagon category, but we sure liked the option of a go fast, rear drive American muscle machine. This next pick is a heavy hitter. It's the rotary-powered fan favorite, the RX-7. Mazda has been producing rotary-powered production cars since 1965, but the high point is without a doubt the RX-7 FD, which ran from 1993 to 1995, here in the States anyway. Now, if you'd like to learn more about how the Mazda's RX-7 became the most iconic Japanese sports car, maybe ever, click this link right up here. All you really need to know is this is one of the most beautiful and best sounding sports cars of all time. The legend of the RX-7 shouldn't go down with Mazda's stab at a rebirth with the frankly not awesome RX-8. These two spots are reserved for the last of the naturally aspirated V10 and V12 raging bulls. Lamborghini is transitioning to hybrid powertrains for its next generation of supercars, but their DNA has always been built on making the best, baddest, most over-the-top naturally aspirated internal combustion engines. Will the history books show the Huracan and Aventador to have two of the greatest ice powertrains of all time? We're willing to bet yes. If you don't believe me, take a listen to this. <laughs> And it's a sad day once these bulls are put out to pasture. There's really only two things you need to know about the S2K. One, 
it still looks glorious, and more importantly too, it still shreds for a car that's nearly 25 years old. That's thanks to its Revy 2 liter 4 banger that redlines at 9,000 RPM. The S2000 is one of the biggest casualties of the 2008 recession, and we wish there were new models still ripping through their rev counters today. You knew it was coming. It dominated the streets. Silver screen and need for speed. You know it was your go-to in Underground 2. The Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution, aka the Evo, is a legend. It's a tragedy that Mitsubishi gave up on building this all-wheel drive all-star. Mitsubishi's current slump can be traced back to when they gave up on this rally drift and street legend in 2016. It's easily one of the top picks for a car that never should have been killed off. And hey, real quick, honorable mention for the WRX STI. Moment of silence. Okay, moment's over. Back to the list. If you look up the definition of halo car in the dictionary, it's just a photo of a Lexus LFA. Look up best Japanese car, LFA. Look up best supercar, LFA. Look up greatest car ever named. You might just find a video that we made about the LFA. You can check that out right up here. This all carbon fiber V10 powered beast set the bar for just how super the supercar could be. And over a decade later, it still holds its own as the best. So how do you come to the conclusion that you should stop making literally the greatest car ever? Well, maybe it was the insane $400,000 price tag, or the fact that they lost hundreds of thousands of dollars on every one they made, even at that price. Picking up a used model today could cost you over a million. I mean, how could we not call this number one? Spoiler alert, we've already featured it in our best cars ever made. Check out that video right up here. And it's a car we have a lot of experience with firsthand, including when we drove one halfway across the country. It's a V10-powered tire-slaying monster. Whatever you do in this thing, it feels dangerous, because it is. There's a reason it's known as the modern Widowman. But even as wild and dangerous as it is, there's a purity to the Viper. It's America's supercar. It goes wicked fast. It sounds absolutely wild, and it will get you into trouble. We think the world is a little worse off now that they're no longer rolling off the assembly line, and that's why it's our number one car that should never have been killed off. So, what'd you think of our list? What killed off cars are your favorites? Which ones did we miss? Did the Dodge Dart or Chevy SS deserve a spot on the list? Let us know down in the comments. We might just revisit this list again in the future. In the meantime, for all things car related, killed off or otherwise, this is Trav, this has been Ideal, and we'll see you all next time.